this the EOR, um, you know, we're 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 a, a kind of five billion dollar industry right now. Mm -hmm. It'll be it's growing significantly. It'll be a hundred billion dollar industry in the next fifteen years. That's a lot of money. Now recruiters are leaving recruiters on the table. Recruiters need to tap into that. Yeah. Welcome back to another episode of Rec Talk. Uh, I'm your host, Nitin Sharma, the founder, CEO, blah, 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 of Rectools.io. Uh, Rectools, as you probably know by now, is the only whole of market directory in uh, the recruitment industry. So if you're looking for a new supplier to your business, uh, whether it's a CRM, whether it's a new website, whether it's a uh, outsourcing your marketing, whether it's an umbrella company, whether it's timesheet software, whatever it might be that you're looking for your recruitment industry, uh, your agency, sorry, uh, head over to rectools.io. We've got almost everybody listed there. If you're not listed there, get in touch with me and get your free listing done as soon as possible. Um, the site and the platform is the busiest it's ever been because I think there's a change going on in the industry right now where consumers are starting to wise up. So if you supply into the recruitment industry, get onto rectools.io and claim, a, well, get your listing for starters, which is free, and then claim it, and we can work together, we can do some cool stuff. Um, I'm looking forward to this episode, actually, because there's a lot of questions that I had off camera, and, and, and me and my guests have been um, really going kind of into detail, which, you know, sometimes I wish we'd recorded all of that, because that would be the podcast, but um, there's a particular kind of trend happening in the recruitment industry right now, where uh, we're sort of maybe wising up to the fact that, hey, globalization is a thing, and we could and should be taking advantage of sort of, you know, um, staffing and solutions maybe outside of the UK for certain skill sets. So you may have heard the term EOR thrown around quite a bit, um, employer of record, and you might be sitting there going, oh, I kind of know what that is, or I don't really know what that is. So to sort of dispel the myths, go into a bit of detail, and talk to us about where this trend has come from and where we could potentially be heading. My guest today is Shamir Gakani. You are the lead of people in growth over at Teamed, right? I am indeed. There yes. you go, mate. Appreciate you uh, taking the time to come over today. I hope the beer's cold and I hope it you're is indeed. Thank you for that and thank you for having me. That's my pleasure, mate. My pleasure. So, EOR, what is it? Why, why, why is this the buzzword right now? EOR, what is it? If I had a pound for every time I was asked that in the book, I'd be sorted right now. But, I mean, there's um, a lot of recruitment consultants out there, right? And there, there, is, agencies, but... there is. Um, EOR, what is it? So it stands for Employer of Record, uh, which fundamentally means that we're a third party organization mm -hmm. that enables companies to compliantly employ talent around the world. Okay. So typically, we're sitting in the UK right now, and if you want to employ someone, employ, not contractors, not freelancers, but actually employ. Right, so you're not an umbrella company? No, no. So right now, we're in the UK, if you want to employ someone in Spain, in Portugal, in South Africa, regardless of wherever the talent is, you would technically have to go and open an entity or a subsidiary in that country mm -hmm. to be able to employ that talent. That's the old way. Now, if you find talent, regardless of where they're in the world, you can use an employer of record like Teams and we'll do the employment for you. So in essence, what that means is we're opening entities around the world right, okay. and we are then employing that talent in Spain on your behalf. Okay. So you find the individual or a recruitment agency finds the individual and then once you've found the person, Come speak with us, right. and we'll do So the source and supply else. piece isn't, isn't what? That, that, <coughs> team specifically. Team specifically, do. we don't source talent. We have partners. What about other EOR companies? Is it, is it fair to say then, it, it, most EOR, is it fair to say that EOR companies are essentially the, the compliance arm? And, Correct. You know, Correct. anybody who claims that they provide a source and selection service for offshore are likely not to be an EOR. They actually probably use an EOR. Correct. So I think so. There are some. I think there are some larger EORs that might be in that kind of source and selection right. space. Not many. Um, more than anything, they probably have like remote job boards kind of thing for their for their clients for um, them to post to their ads. People, yeah, but yeah, beyond yeah. that, there's not that many that actually do the sourcing and selecting. That's where we have partners. So if someone says to me right now, "Hey Shamir, I need a team of developers in in South Africa, for example," I I would just introduce our partner. Or mm, one of our partners okay. who can who can help. So I think you had you can Kyle. shout them out if you want. Yeah, yeah you had yeah. Kyle from yeah. Tapped on the show a few weeks back. Um, you know, it, it just case in point, I think an email came through this morning um, where you know we had a client come through. So they've been looking to build a team out in South Africa. I had to speak to Kyle. Kyle's your man. 
he'll do that. And then once they're ready, they've sourced, they've interviewed, they've found the talent, then they'll come back to us and we'll manage everything to do with compliance, everything to do with payroll, including mm -hmm. taxes, and everything to do with benefits. That's our kind of core of, of what we do. Okay. <clears throat> And then above and beyond that, we do other bits and pieces like um, you know remote working spaces and getting laptops out. Sort of value add stuff that you kind of need to actually physically do it right. But what's this? Where's this trend come from? Why are so many people going? Like South Africa is obviously a big um, sort of space at the minute, right? Where yeah. people are doing this. But what? Where? Where else are people doing it? And where's this come from? So so this is actually so EORs aren't new. Mm -hmm. I think the the employer of record model. Um, has been around for quite some time, probably more so in the US. I think it all started in the US. Like many other things, it kind of starts in the US and then makes its way yeah. across the globe. So some of the old guard, you know, some of these um, companies that have been around for 10, 15, 20 years doing this EOR piece. Right, okay. Um, and then, you know, it kind of makes its way over to Europe and obviously we're a European-based EOR. Um, so it's been around a while. And, and, and I think, you know, fundamentally, in recent years at least, the two drivers for us specifically mm. COVID-19 and Brexit. Those two, although both tragic in my opinion, and it's my opinion, personal opinions, but those two things have seen our business skyrocket. Yeah. Okay. Um, so because more and more people now, obviously during COVID, of course, you know, people were forced to work at home and then what well, they realized is actually I can do my job. Yeah, there was an overnight digitalization of most businesses. Absolutely. Yeah. So that has now, what that's resulted in is <clears throat> actually kind of employees saying, well, hold on a minute. You know, I was working in London, COVID hit. I was sitting at home for 18 months, two years. I'm actually, you know, from Germany or from France or from Spain or from Portugal or wherever. I now want to go back home. I still want to continue to do my job. I still want to work for the company in London, but I want to do it from my home or where I'm from in Spain. I suppose, yeah, the other, the other side of it is exactly from the, from the, um, the business owner's perspective, right? It's sort of like pre-COVID, the majority of recruitment agencies were localised, you know, talent was, mm. like, the, like, the talent that worked for you were local people. So mm. you would select your office, right, I need to have a space in Birmingham. Yeah. Because there's no point in me having an office in Coventry because I'm only going to get people that can get to Coventry. Yeah. Birmingham's got more people, therefore, and, and competitors, therefore, all yeah. those. And then if you sat there and you're kind of like, well, hang on, I'm not, I've got teams scattered all over the UK. Um, they're not coming to a single point for us to, you know, I'm managing them remotely. Yeah. I'm now replacing this person with somebody who is in Glasgow. Well, why, yeah. if I can take somebody from Glasgow and have them in my business, why can't um, I look at somewhere else? Somewhere else, Absolutely. a bit further afield, a bit, a bit further afield. And actually, it's those companies, and it might have been COVID that <clears throat> made them think like that for that transition. But actually, it's those companies that build uh, that are the kind of the very core of our customer base. Mm -hmm. These are the kind of remote first companies. They don't care where the talent is; yeah. they just want the best talent. And so, it's, it's fair to say that this model was probably more of a known thing in the tech industry before. Before it came, yeah, to sort of value. I think so. Yeah, and um, you know, it's it's because tech teams have tech... always been remote and always yeah. been kind of scattered teams and working, you know, work in a very different manner. Yeah, and I think they're always going to be the early adopters of all of these yeah. things, right? So, um, so yeah, you know, a significant portion of our business is indeed kind of tech companies, first. and they're the, you know, they're t remote first. You know, some of them were born during the, the pandemic, mm. so they were, you know, remote is all they know. <clears throat> and so, yeah, you know, the, the, and now if you think about it, you know, with this whole kind of Web3 and blockchain and AI and the, 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 the skills are everywhere. Yeah. If you're, if, you, if you're naive enough to think that actually, well, we've got an open an office in London because that's where the, you're, you're missing out. Yeah, or I've got to go Silicon Valley. Yeah. Right, yeah. The, the talent is everywhere. And so now it's about using... Um, um, your skills or the recruiter's skills or whatever they might be or in-house recruiters, recruitment agencies, mm. whatever it looks like to find those kind of unicorn individuals who are dotted in, you know, in Panama or in, it doesn't matter, you know, they're everywhere. It gets rid of the sponsorship thing, I suppose, as well, isn't it, right? That, 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 that's that's Absolutely. no longer a conversation then. Not really. I mean, you know, eight, probably eight more than that, actually, 95, 98% of the people we employ Mm. on behalf of our clients have the right to live and work in the country that they're in. They're usually residents or they, they might be in, in, in the EU so they might have moved around a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally they have the right to live and work where they live. So 
So yeah, no visas, no nothing. And actually, you know, when we speak about remote, I've, I've worked remotely for years, uh, from home for, 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 uh, for years. So this whole kind of work-life balance thing and that co kind of conversation, that kind of comes into play because now, you know, we're employing people around the world, <clears throat> single mothers in Nigeria, for example, who have an equal opportunity at a, at a job and a career than someone sitting in Birmingham or Coventry or London or wherever it is. And I think that is quite interesting because what we're doing is kind of leveling the playing field, as it were, and giving people, those that would never have had access to a, a career as such because of where they're based or their situation, now they can apply, mm. uh, you know, and now they can be, feel confident enough that if I have the skills, I've got the opportunity. Yeah, it's no longer about raise the money to <clears throat> get the sponsorship and go over and figure out a way to kind of land yeah. and, and, and do it. Okay, fair. So you mentioned South Africa quite a bit because obviously that seems to be um, a popular um, destination. Why? Yeah. Why is that so popular? And where else uh, uh, are your customers? Yeah. So South Africa, Africa is the large, in terms of where we employ talent around mm -hmm. the world on behalf of clients, South Africa is the biggest in terms of the volume of people. And that's mainly down to um, time zones mm -hmm. compared to the UK or Europe, but the UK. Um, English speaking, you know, or well, first language uh, is English. Um, their qualifications are very similar to ours mm -hmm. in certain sectors. So accounting, financial services, and legal, they've got uh, very similar qualifications. Um, the the uh, employer costs are far cheaper, and I'm not talking about salaries, I'm not talking about salaries at all, okay. but the employer costs are far cheaper. Right. So if you're paying someone £50,000 in the UK, and then you took that and paid fifty the equivalent of £50,000 in South African Rand, you'd find that the employer contributions, so the social security contributions, are lower in South Africa. Mm, okay. <clears throat> Here they're like 20 odd percent, there they're like four and a half, five. So immediately, and I'm not talking about salaries, but that employer cost, you've just, you've significantly mm. reduced the cost to employ someone in South Africa than, than in the UK, for example. Yeah, yeah, I am with it, yeah. Um, so yeah, and then things like GDPR regulations are very, very similar. So there's, there's a lot of alignment, especially with the UK and Europe, but a lot of alignment with the UK that works very, very well. Okay. And there's an abundance of talent and they want to work, right? They want to, you know, we work with uh, loads of accountants, loads and loads of accountants who are struggling to retain talent mm -hmm. here in the UK, especially audit talent. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that there's people that are qualified in, in so what happens in the UK is a, a, an audit professional will come and join, a junior will come and join yeah, a company, audit system. they'll get their skills, they'll get their certifications, mm -hmm. and then they're off. 18 months within a, a, a mid-tier accounting firm, they'll get their quality, and then they want to go to the bright lights of London. Fair enough, we all did. But what we've got in South Africa is people that are actually willing to stick around. Yes, you might, you'll pay for their qualifications or whatever the case may be, but they'll, they'll stay with you. The retention is far better because, because the opportunities aren't. I was going to say, why, why is that then? What, could, <clears throat> you, you're quite confident in saying that. Yeah, absolutely. So no, what, if, what's if, the rationale if, then? What, why are they it, not if, you know, looking to get six months worth of UK experience, 18 months worth of UK experience, and then being like, I'm going to go somewhere else now. I'm not going to go to the big four. As an example. Well, so, I mean, they're getting experience with a UK firm. Mm. They're just obviously sitting in their home in, in yeah, South yeah. Africa. Um, so yeah. they're getting the experience of working with a UK firm. But typically, to then, you know, every, where are some of the old, uh, sort of the big four, and those guys are pro very much kind of in-house, not so much remote working, mm. friendly. You know, it's harder for them to get their qualifications and then, you know, you, you might have the opportunity, but ultimately, here you've got an abundance of talent on volumes of it, where if you're getting paid the equivalent of an auditor here, mm -hmm. you're going to stick around. You know, you're getting paid 30, 40, 50 K. Yeah, okay. You're there, yeah, you're getting the qualifications, yeah, yeah. you stick around, you've got that comfort of working from home. It just works very, very well. Okay. So then where, where else in the world are, are people drawing talent from through uh, kind of what so you've Yeah, so, so Philippines is strong right now. A lot of people hiring in the Philippines. Um, Parts of Eastern Europe, a lot of strong software development out mm -hmm. um, in, in parts of Eastern Europe is going really, really well. Uh, the US, people are often, uh, w because they wanted to expand into the US market, mm -hmm. we, we find a lot of companies, tech companies mainly, who want to have boots on the ground very quickly. 
let's get boots on the ground. So they'll use an EOR. We'll employ three, four, five salespeople in the US. Yeah. And then if, it, if they prove it, that it works in the US, then they'll go and open their own right. institute. And so actually, time, yeah, there's a few different ways of doing it. Right? <clears throat> because again, when Carl was on the podcast, we, we were talking about how what a lot of the trend was in the recruitment sector was that people were, UK recruitment businesses were hiring people in South Africa and the Philippines, experienced recruiters, but for the sole purpose of recruiting US time zones in the US. Mm -hmm. Whereas what you're saying is there is also, kind of flip it on its head, you could actually hire local talent in the US to head up your US operations. Yeah, absolutely. Which, yeah, then kind of leans into the conversation that I had uh, with Clark um, Bowles from PGC Group, which is around kind of land and expand. Mm -hmm. right? It's not, yeah, because there's certain things in certain US territories that work better than the they do still want a local presence and they yeah, do still absolutely. want to see and meet people absolutely. and therefore a fully remote model necessarily uh, wouldn't work wouldn't work in a in a recruitment business depending on the sector in which you recruit yeah no absolutely so we so we one of our very early clients of financial services mm. they were testing out actually the way they became a client was quite weird because they actually interviewed someone mm. they had three rounds of interviews i think it was just before covid um, and obviously on a screen, on a Zoom call. Yeah, yeah. And they, they thought they were interviewing someone who was based in London. Okay. It was only after interview three that they figured out that the guy was based in Greece. Right. Like, oh, right, okay, now we've got a problem. We want this guy, but he's based in Greece. They came to us, we employed that person in Greece. It worked well. So then they hired a few more in Europe, and it, and it kind of worked well. Then what they thought is actually, we, we're expanding into the US market. We want to expand into the US market. So let's get boots, let's use team to get boots on the ground. Americans, you know, one in New York, one in California, one in Texas, whatever it was, mm -hmm. and one in Boston, and then we employed those people locally. Rather than having to set up a local entity, go through all the, the rigmarole, set Correct. up the tax stuff. Until such time as they proved that, that the business worked. So they had 18 months, 12, uh, 18, I think two years, they, they used our service. It There'd worked. be a point where actually the cost of using you guys then is, 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 is outweighing the cost of actually being there. So Absolutely. Yeah. And so when we hired about, I think, was, I think the tipping point for those guys was about 10, 12 hires. After they hit about 12, they said, right, we're ready to open now. I mean, they were ready before and they were going through the process. And then once they had established everything, we simply migrated those 12 and people to over to them. Two people or whatever, yeah. Yeah. So, Interesting. Okay. So yeah, but you know, use cases, we, I think there are fundamentally four or five use cases, which is the first one which we spoke about, which is we're a remote first company. We don't care where the talent is based. We just want the first talent around the world. Okay. That's very common. Then you've got relocation. So you've got someone, like I said, during COVID, you know, they said, right, I want to move back to Spain. Yeah. Are you happy for me to work from Spain? And companies most, more often than not, if you want to retain that talent, they'll say yes. Mm -hmm. So relocation. Contractor conversion. And so that's an interesting one because, you know, it's easy to, you know, find someone in Portugal and have them as a contractor and, and that, you know, be done with it. However, what we found is when HR people come into an organization and they figure out the hold on a minute, there's a little bit of a, we could, we could be at risk of misclassification of employment. We should really not have that person as a contractor. They should be an employee mm -hmm. because you know you could have backdated taxes and fines and all the rest of it. It's, too, it's just too risky. And actually, from the employee's perspective as well, it's a level of security, and we don't know what the lending criteria might be, right? I know here in the UK, if you're a contractor, you find it exceedingly difficult to yep. get a mortgage. Absolutely. So if this guy's like, look, I work for this company, okay, the contract of employment is a temporary contract of employment. Yeah. And you might have been there for ten years, but you're still a temp in theory. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So and so that's no, yeah. so we had exactly the same thing where um, uh, a client had two people relocating back to Roman uh, to Romania, and one of them they're Romanian they mm -hmm. went back to Romania, um, and one of them wants to get a mortgage, and he said oh, I'm going to go back to Romania I'll be a contractor everything's fine, then he went to get a mortgage, uh, denied, he used us he's got his mortgage. Yeah. So that's absolutely so contract conversion and it's usually. So there's that, the employee side and the contract side, but it's usually HR people. When, when, when someone's an official HR person, then they kind of crap themselves and they hold on a minute. We're, we're at risk. This is a risk yeah. uh, and we need to convert. We need that's to make why we hire them. But, you know, that's, so, that's why, yeah. So yeah, contract yeah. conversion. The land and expand thing we spoke about, that's, yeah. that's the, it, very common. You know, we want to establish ourselves in growing a country. Let's get a few boots on the ground. Let's see how it goes. And the fifth one, which I'm hearing only the last six to eight months, really, is entities closing down. So, and 
on the three or four occasions that I've heard about this, it's Canadian entities closing down. Don't ask me why, I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure. Yeah. But companies in Canada who are downsizing and they don't want the cost and time and effort of continuing to run an entity there because they've gone from 15 employees to four right. and therefore will come in and will employ those people uh, in Canada. They want to retain four people, we'll look after them. But generally they're kind of winding down. Yeah, 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 so okay. people that are closing down entities, um, which is happening, is not very common, to be fair, it's the lowest on the list of the five use cases, but, but, but it's, yeah, it's happening. If it's starting to happen, that could lead to a trend of, hang on a minute, there, there's, because yeah. we know the world economy is in a strange place and yeah. you don't know what people are doing with their businesses, right? Yeah. Okay, here's another one, um, here's one for you that's come to mind. So I'm working for XYZ employer in the UK. Mm -hmm. I've decided, right, I've, I'll, I'll let you into a little secret here, right? So, me and my uh, closest pal, we, we have a, an escape plan, right? <coughs> All goes to shit, and our whole world starts to end. Our escape plan is, we're, we're, we're actively searching for this, and we missed out on this one plot. We're actively searching for a stretch of land out in Spain somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Or s somewhere hot, right? Mm -hmm. It could be Spain, Portugal, wherever, but Portugal. like, you know, UK speaking, you know, or British speaking enough that we can get by and we can learn a bit, right? Mm -hmm. And... So say I've found my little spot, right? I'm mm -hmm. on 12 acres of land out in wherever, and I've gone, Mr. Employer, Mrs. Employer, I'm leaving, I'm moving to Portugal. Mm -hmm. But they don't have the ability to, you know, do you know what I mean? Like to sort of facilitate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Is that a, a, a good use case of coming to a, a company such as Absolutely. Team or any yeah, yeah. other EOI and saying, right, I have an employee who is moving abroad yeah. somewhere, right? Because that's the one thing that stops a lot of people from, because you, know, you get a lot of this, right? There's, there's a big, um, and I'm gonna go kind of on a bit of a tangent here, but you know, you've got the millennial awakening, right? People are like widening up and they're kind of like, hang on, this corporate treadmill just isn't quite doing it for me anymore. I feel something's lost, that kind of thing. Mm. I know a lot of people in that situation and they're all kind of like, I wish I could just move away. Like, I just wish I could move away, mm. right? If things carry on the way they're going in this country, I don't want to be here anymore. Mm. And by the time this goes out, we'll hopefully have a new government in place. Mm. But as it currently stands, it's sort of like, I don't see a future here, right? Mm. The options are things like migrating, right? So you've got to then apply for, um, you know, visas and all the rest mm. of it to be able to then move to Australia or New Zealand or you know, I'm not sure what the situation is at the minute because of Brexit to move to Spain mm -hmm. as an expat and stuff. Um, but then the additional complication becomes well, then you're in their local economy and you're only going to earn what they're going to pay. Mm -hmm. So this is a good way, I suppose, to Absolutely. sit there and be like, actually, do you know what? I want to try it before I buy it or whatever. Yeah. And I want to move out to Spain for six months. Yeah. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to keep my job. Like yeah. I'm already working remote. Yeah. What does it matter if I'm sat in, you know, uh, you know, my back bedroom in Windsor, or whether I'm on a beach in in, in Spain? So I'm going to do my hours and do my work, right? Absolutely. And there'll be a tipping, there'll be a I keep saying tipping point. There'll be a um, there'll be a point in time yeah. where today I can I, I work remotely. All of us do. I can now go to Spain. I can get after this go straight to East Midlands Airport. Well, this get on is a flight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now I can I can stay in Portugal, Spain, whatever, without anything, and. Um, because I'm, I'm still a UK tax resident. Yes. I'm still paying my, my taxes, my employees. That's it. And at some point, usually 183 days, you then become a Portuguese tax resident. So as long as I have the right to Yeah, but work, you talk about digital nomads, yeah. right? If you're, that used to be pretty much the tech market or tech world. Mm -hmm. We're now in a world where a lot of people work remotely. And actually, if you're a remote worker, you could become a digital nomad, right? And you can yeah. go, do you know what? The most I can stay there is arguably three months. Yep. But I'm going to go and just travel around Europe and just move about. Yeah. Still working for my UK based employer. Yeah. It ain't costing them any further. Like, well, not it costing them any further, but it's not impacting them any further because they haven't got to do all sorts of different stuff. It's a very simple, okay, you used to pay me directly. You're now kind of working with this EOI company that's going to facilitate you being able to allow me to do what I need to do whilst continuing to work for you. But in that case, in that particular situation, you don't even need an EOI company. Because if I'm off in... Spain, for example, for a short period of time, right, okay, then you're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's when you become a tax resident. Uh, so there's a period of time. Okay, so that's the cut-off point. So that's the fully, I'm moving, I'm going. Yeah, if you're yeah. off and you're, you know, you're, not, you're not planning to come back in the next six months, mm -hmm. then after that six-month period, 183 days typically, that's when you're now. So you, I can go now and go for three months and say nothing and no one will know anything. Yeah. I could just go and come back. But if I want to stay for longer in Portugal or wherever it is and 
I don't know if Portugal is on my radar. Yeah. If I'm in escape, I'm on my radar. You'll go Portugal, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's, then I, then I need to have the right to live and work. Fine. So I've got to okay. go. And so then you've got to apply for your visas and so on and so forth. Fine. Okay. So this is a, yeah, this is something that potentially could become a line of inquiry in the future. But fundamentally, it's a, I'm a UK business. I want to hire talent. Let's talk about the elephant in the room, the affordability piece, right? Um, it's obviously cheaper to hire people out in South Africa, Philippines than it is. I'm not going to pay a, a recruitment resourcer that I pay £20,000 in the UK or, or £24,000 now. I'm not going to pay them £24,000. I'm not going to pay somebody in the Philippines the same amount, mm -hmm. realistically, am I? Mm -hmm. For two reasons. Number one, I don't have to. But number two, I risk upsetting the balance of kind of because you don't want you you know you don't want to actively encourage people going like listen you're, all your competitors are paying these guys the equivalent of six hundred pound a month if you pay them nine hundred pound a month they're all going to want to work for you because that upsets the the, the sort of the apple cart right so so yes you're absolutely right we never really advocate for going overseas because it's cheaper just to be clear we don't we, that's not what that's not what we promote actively in any way shape or form but yes it's a byproduct of this of course people are looking. You know, they might they might need to cut costs for whatever reason, but they can get as good a talent, if not better, in the Philippines, in India, in Pakistan, in South Africa, mm -hmm. and it's a it, it is what it is. Um. So yes, but then on the flip side of that, we have clients who say, well, we're paying sixty grand here. We'll happily pay if if the talent is there, and they're delivering what they're supposed to, and, and they're happy to pay the same thing. We have a um, having conversation a couple of days ago, where. <clears throat> A UK, uh, someone who's working in the UK is actually uh, has requested to relocate back to East Africa. Mm -hmm. So the employees have got um, kind of done here. I want to move back to I think it's Kenya. Um, and I don't, I, I don't blame them. Yeah, no, me neither. And the employee, uh, the employer rather, I've had a conversation with them. You know, explain how it all works, the costs, everything. And then I asked the question. I said, "Are you looking to retain? Is this person going to be on the same salary, or are they going to do?" And they said they're going to be on exactly the same salary. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that because it's his request, your our fee will come out of his salary. So that this is what it costs for us to employ this person in the UK. Yeah, we don't want to spend a penny more. So if he wants to relocate to Kenya, we're you more than that. happy to do that. You can keep the same same money that he makes, but he's paying for the it, additional cost that the, the business would otherwise incur in order to facilitate that revenue. Correct. Oh, that's a really, yeah, okay. That's, and that's I, and I quite idea. like that. I like the fact that a lot of companies are willing to, especially those that have requested to relocate yeah. back home. I want to go back home, my family, for whatever reason, right? People want to go back home. And a lot of these companies are saying, yeah, do you know what? We'll, we'll allow it, work from home. We, obviously, you're a great employee. We want to retain you. Now, if you, if you go there, we're going to have to pay teamed fees yeah. in this case. So if you're happy to just take the hit on that, and it's not expensive, by the way, but if you're having yeah. to take a little bit of a hit on that, reduce your salary by, you know, six Work, whatever a year, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. then go. go. Enjoy it. Yeah, um, fair. And you've got the right to live and work there. Do your thing. No, that's cool. Uh, so, so it's a nice I, thing. Look, I, I, I'm, I'm paying devil's advocate, right? Or the, yeah. um, the, the, the kind of the role that I have to play, which is sort of what about both sides. But yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, as I said to Kyle um, from Untapped, if your key driver in hiring offshore staff is price and only price like with respect do what right because Absolutely. what you're trying to do that that's no different to, to kind of taking you're just taking advantage of people yeah and, and that that's the bit that <clears throat> that's the bit that puts me off right. so, so yeah it's, it's not fair it's not right right you're looking for a you know you want somebody who can run your professional services desk or expansion into the u.s market and they happen to be sat in south africa and you're going to intentionally pay them lower because you can. That, mm. Yeah, you know, yeah. culturally says a lot about that business, personally, from, from my perspective. So, yeah, just to clarify. No, we're yeah. absolutely on the same page. We're oh. not, we never advocate for going abroad because it's cheaper or to, no. you know, exploit people. That's not our thing. Absolutely not. The reality thing. is, if you're in a situation right now as a recruitment business owner where you're feeling as though the talent pool in which you're trying to pull staff from or ex entice staff into your business is limited and you're not happy or you want mm. to see more, mm. that's the perfect use case scenario to say, Absolutely. okay, well, let me have a chat with a few people from South Africa, from the Philippines, Absolutely. from Lithuania, wherever, 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 
who have got the skill sets and the experience and actually might have a bit more experience to bring to the table because of the salary differential, right? Yeah. If I'm sat there like, I'm going to pay 40 grand and I know in the UK, 40 grand is only going to get me a, a recruiter with two years experience that can bill 150 grand a year at tops. But 40 grand over in South it's Africa is going to get me a you know 300k biller yeah. and this person's got 10 years experience yeah, exactly. and has a back book of candidates and clients that they're connected to on LinkedIn because they're not just a call set for this bash about calls. They're an actual recruitment consultant. Absolutely. That makes sense. Massive. But if I'm going to be like, oh no, but you're in South Africa, so I'm going to bash you down to 30 grand. Like, it's, that's, that's a shitty thing to do. Yeah, no, I'm with you. Absolutely. So is there anywhere in the world where you can't do this? Whether it's law, whether it's, yeah, no. you know what I mean? So, no, we, we cover over 150 countries. Okay. There are 190 something. But there are some countries that we've taken a position on because of what's going on in the world. Right, right fair. Okay. Um, so we can, we can leave up there. Yeah, yeah, and that's why right. for now we just don't do it. So, so the reason, so what I was going to, what I was going to ask was actually around, there's a, there was a big expansion sort of within the last decade, right, from the UK real estate market, sending people out to UAE and Dubai mm-hmm. and making mm-hmm. a lot of money out there and that sort mm-hmm. of stuff, right? That I've, I'm, I'm noticing has creeped in in the last sort of five years, has creeped into the recruitment industry as well. But what's very interesting is that those that do it, they're very quiet about it. Like US is the place to land and expand. The US is loads of money to be made out there, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I've spoken to and know a ha- like more than a handful of businesses who are also dabbling in that sort of UAE market US, yes. and they're making a lot of money, but they're keeping it very, very quiet. It's mm. almost like they don't want others to, to cotton on. Mm. So. Can you shed some light on that market? Is that something that you guys have got much experience in? Is yeah. there much going on over there yeah. within the recruitment So there sector? is. Um, recruitment, I can't really speak too much on the recruitment specifically, Okay. to be fair. Um, what in I general, do know, generally, the demand is there. A lot of people who are expanding into the UAE um, uh, are using EORs to get the, again, it's the same, same story, get the boots on the ground. You get us now. In all fairness, it's probably not that complicated to set up your own entity in the UAE, in mm-hmm. Dubai, really. But initially, just to get boots on the ground, if you need some, I can have an employment contract out to someone in Dubai tomorrow. Not tomorrow; it's Saturday. On Monday, I can yeah, get yeah. it done. Yeah. It's not a problem. And and we can do it very. And that's pretty much everywhere around the world. So and the demand in 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 the UAE is definitely definitely there. What's also interesting, and this is more on a personal level is all of my younger cousins. You know, I, th- I feel like Dubai has gone through a bit of a, yeah. you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, a whole bunch of people went to go to place, yeah. And then it may have dropped off a little bit, yeah. but now it's, it's back on. Yeah. So now I'm having conversations with my younger t- 22, 23, 24 year old cousins and nieces and those stuff. So yeah, we're ready to move out to Dubai. And people are requesting, they're, they're going to, I have a, um, uh, my niece's husband, um, he went to his employer and said, look, I want to move to Dubai. Me, my, my wife and my new child want to move to Dubai. Can you make it happen? Now, th- that request worked very well because they actually have an entity in, in Dubai, so they can just transfer it. Yeah, yeah. But more and more of those conversations are happening. And if, and if the employer is happy to allow that to happen, we're there to support. We can you make can it happen. Easy, yeah, very, yeah, very yeah. easy. But the, the, the UAE, um, uh, Saudi Arabia right now, um, in the past week this week i've probably had four or five conversations about saudi arabia amazing people wanting to employ in saudi arabia yeah mm, okay so there's awesome. a lot of stuff happening it's like it's getting you know that that part of the world is definitely definitely picking up right yeah what about india things. uh i mean we employ people in india it i feel like that was probably a thing yeah, i don't know it, it's it's not as i mean we employ people in india of course but it's not one of the hot, I don't hear about India on, yeah, on, a, on a daily, yeah, yeah, yeah. weekly basis. I hear about the Philippines, I hear about South Africa, I hear about the UAE, the US, Europe, India, you, yeah, from time to time. It's not as, as hot as, and I don't know why. It's, 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 it's fascinating. So I was there not long ago, right? And I, uh, I met some really interesting people. And the, my, my biggest takeaway from there was that they have very little interest in engaging with globalization in terms of their businesses mm. like if you're a business owner at whatever level in india you can become a multi multi-millionaire 
just servicing your local market yeah. and just servicing yeah. the Indian market. Yeah. You don't need to even look outside. Yeah. Whereas our country is an example, is so small, that we kind of hit a ceiling quite quickly yeah. in terms of those companies that go through ultra growth and are like, okay, we need to now take this product and sell it everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Dyson is an example, right? There's only so yeah. many people in the UK who are gonna buy a Dyson and yeah. then you've got to look outside. Yeah. Whereas there's like, by complete contrast to that, you have a tire manufacturer in India who yeah. Yeah. basically yeah. only supplies yeah. in the Indian market yeah. and are the leading tire manufacturer. Yeah. You know, and Dunlop, Goodyear and all the rest of them don't know about these guys right? yeah. because they just looked after that market. Yeah. And I find that really fascinating. But equally at the same time, I think there's, um, there's, there's a lot to be said about kind of the work ethic and stuff like that. So when mm. I'm kind of sitting here as a former business owner or a recruitment business, I'm kind of thinking there's parts of India where these guys have got quite Americanized accents mm -hmm. and they are ex-colonial, right? So there is a, 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 not as much of a cultural barrier as you think there is. Mm -hmm. I think India struggles with the fact that it immediately gets kind of brashed with the yeah. Indian core set of mentality, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, I and, and I think that, that kind <clears> of <throat> is, for me personally, I think it's a missed opportunity for a lot of people mm. because there'll be just as many decent good people out there with you, which you got to remember, uh, the a lot of the world is investing in India right now. Mm. You know, Amazon is setting up a shop up there. Tesla are setting up shop up there. Mm. Uh, you know, Apple are up there. Microsoft are in there. There, all these, this kind of everyone else seems to have kind of gone. Oh yeah, we're going over there. The yeah. SME market seems to be sort of reluctant yeah. to engage. I think so. I find that a bit fascinating, really. I think right. But also, I think the the, the demands of the the kind of the. I was going to call them the youth, but those that are coming up in India, yeah. you know, whereas you could back in the day pay pittance in India. And oh, yeah, no, you can't do that. You can't no, do that anymore. That's not no, what no, happens. No, so no, if you're no, thinking, no. well, I'm going to go to India because it's cheap. No, it's what you go to India not, for is right. for highly academically intelligent yeah. people yeah, yeah, yeah. who have got not many places to apply that. Yeah. Because, you know, they, they're also going through a bit of a metamorphosis where they don't want to work for the big American corporates anymore. Yeah. They want to be in that startup world. They, they you yeah. know, that. I mean, I was in. <clears throat> granted, it was Mumbai, right? Which, I mean, Mumbai in itself is always going to be different to the rest of India. Rest of India. It's like LA in the eighties, right? Yeah. But the the going out culture, the coffee culture. Yeah. You know, there's a coffee shop everywhere. Yeah. You know, there's there's like recreational activities everywhere. Yeah. There's yeah. and 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 they they're kind of going through this sort of thing of like they want that Silicon Valley life. Yeah. And I think if there's businesses in the UK who can provide a level of kind of that level of flexibility and relaxed working environment, yeah. that's definitely a place that people need to be looking at because yeah. there's, there's a lot of talented people in India. Yeah, a lot yeah of no, absolutely. People. It's right, we, we don't, I mean, again, we do, but it's not, it's not, it's not up there in the top 10, I would say, when in, term, in terms of where we're employed. So who is your top 10 though? In terms like, of no, locations. No, no, and I won't hold you to it, but yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Who, who would South you? Africa, number one. Yeah. Portugal, big. Really? Spain, big. The US, big. Um, Poland, Romania, big. Uh, some other, yeah, some other parts of Eastern Europe. But, and then, you know, the UAE, like I said, is, is coming up. It's parts of, kind of Latin America coming up. USA, Canada. Mm. Um, and I think I see a little surge in Africa as I, I've mentioned South Africa a million times now, but a Africa surge in general. Africa now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's people. I, I, it fascinates me how we don't like more people don't go to Africa. Yeah. Well, it, it's got everything. Uh, <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It really has got everything. Um, yeah. No, I'm a big advocate for that. I'm a bit devil's advocate. Work ethic. Yes. Ah, they, they, yeah, they've got the ethic. They really have. But that happens when when you're in a when you're brought up in and you're surrounded by this kind of false narrative of a so-called third world country. The only thing you have is your education, which no one can take from you, and your work ethic, which mm -hmm. no one can take from you. Right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 my parents are migrants, and mm -hmm. you know, back in India, they would have been um, very comfortable. You know in good jobs and all the rest of it. And they rolled the dice and made the decision to come out here mm -hmm. and did the things that people didn't want to do and, and ran the sorts of shops and businesses that people didn't want to do, mm. right? Um, and, and, and that's the thing I learned from them is that, that that kind of work ethic piece, you have that when you're mm. kind of, 
Yeah. Like, seen as, as I said, so-called like third world countries or yeah. second class citizens and that kind of thing. Yeah. That breeds that level of um, uh, sort of desire to do better. Yeah. Which is where I think why the likes of you, the, the countries that you named are so popular because actually for them it's like, well no, I, I can yeah. stand toe to toe with your best recruiter as an example. Yeah. Right? Just give me the opportunity I'll show what I can do. Yeah, right? exactly. Single and half Africa. these people just want the opportunity. Well, this, this is it, they yeah. Want the opportunity. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute, though, because there, there is an angle to this that is um, dreadful, and I'm almost kind of ashamed that I'm going to say it, but is this... Do we not run the risk of... Um, I really, really don't want to say it like this, but I can't... I have to put it this way. Do we not run the risk of... They're not coming here to take our jobs anymore. They're taking them from over there. <laughs> I, I'm so, I, honestly, I feel sick saying that. Yeah, but yeah, that's interesting. Well, look, then is that we, not an we, angle that we need to consider, right? Absolutely, um, and we should. Um, and let's not get it twisted. There are people we speak to companies in the US and Australia and other parts who are using us to employ people in the UK too. Just yeah. to be clear. Yeah. Um, but not as many. Like, not as many. But we're a UK-based company, and eight and eighty percent of our clients. Are, but we 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 have clients in Australia who use us to employ in, in the UK. We have clients in America that use us to employ mm-hmm. in the UK as well. But yes, and that's, is your, your point is absolutely valid. But at the same time, I mean, maybe this sounds a bit harsh as well, but we need to level up. In that, if we've, we, we, today, we have gaming developers, blockchain companies, all these kind of high, you know, mm-hmm. half it goes over my head, by the way. All of these, all of these kind of new tech stuff yeah. who are screaming at us to say, the talent isn't here. What are, what are we supposed to do? If the talent is, I mean, they start yeah. looking in the UK and then it's just not available. Yeah. And that's because, you know, the small number of people that have the skills already snapped up and they're getting paid ridiculous amounts of money or whatever the case may be. Yeah. If they can't find the talent here and they want to scale their business and they need the skills, they have no choice. Mm. So either we need to level up as a country and say, right, we, you know, our education, so we're not on the, we're not on the cusp of, or maybe we are, but we, you know, there's, there's more that is we can it, do. Is it that? Or is it the ones that have got the skill sets that these companies are looking for are in actually, are, you know, are, are so self-aware of their skill set and their ability that they actually would prefer to work for themselves and are more entrepreneurial than they are employee-minded? Yeah. Also, also, right? Do you know what I mean? Is, yeah. it, is it potentially that? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Estonia. Oh, sorry, asking that Estonia. Question, no, no. Oh. <laughs> Estonia. Right yeah. now is buzzing the talent in estonia is buzzing right now and you can get young graduates and, and people that with two three four years experience right. in an abundance with these kind of the blockchain the web3 the mm-hmm. gaming the mm-hmm. crypto stuff again which i don't understand but that stuff is they're there they're, they're there for the taking and you just can't get it here those, those, those programs, those university programs or, or degrees or whatever it is that they're doing, is they're f- in, in Estonia, their education system in that world is far ahead of what we are. It yeah. comes back to that thing I mentioned about, yeah, the few things my old man taught me in life. Well, one of them is exactly that. Education they can't take from you. Yeah. Work ethic they can't take yeah. from you. They can take everything else. They can take your house, they can take your car, they can take yeah. your money. They can't take those two things. Yeah. So perhaps it's a case of actually, yeah, Maybe you're right. Maybe we do need to level up. I think we need to level up. To sort of level scale. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, fair enough. But, um, I, th- I think that's a, that's a thought-provoking place to be. It is. It yeah. is. That's horrible. Wow. <laughs> horrible is asking that question because I'm like, I don't want to say this, but, but yeah. I feel like no, I'm going mean, to reform. Look, at the end like, of the day, the more, the more companies are, that are employing overseas because for whatever the reason is, yes, there's less kind of tax dollars going into our coffers, but then we, 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 we there's other things that we can do. But, I just think we could potentially... I think fundamentally, it's, it's also... Mm-hmm. We've got to consider that doors open both ways. Absolutely. So just because we're, Absolutely. the door can open this way to let people here yeah. and work for our companies in the UK, that yeah. also does mean that you can 100%. move abroad and or go and work for other companies, right? So you could be applying for jobs... Anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world, right? You could work for a, a, an American um, financier. Absolutely. But working from... Your, your bedroom as you currently are now. And that land and expand piece happens both ways. There yes. are American companies that want to enter Europe yeah. and they'll start in the UK. And they'll hire three, four, five people in the UK yeah. without setting up a legal entity because they'll use an, an employer record. Yeah, that's cool. And you know, ahead a country, so we've got a, 
a couple of clients in the UK who have Europe country heads. Yeah. So head of Spain, head of Portugal, head of the UK, whatever. That you know, the American companies are hiring, and then so you know, some bloke in London is now the the country manager for the UK. Same in Spain, same in Portugal. It's the same thing. No, it makes it's sense. Just, um, it does make sense. There you go. Well, right, mate, how do people get in touch with Teamed? Um, if they're out there, they want to find out more. Have you guys got any seminars, webinars, things that they're that are coming up? A YouTube channel, maybe they can yeah. direct them to. So the webinars are always webinars are there. Check out teamed.global. That's T E A M E D dot global. That's the website. We're on all, all the socials, and the marketing guys are chucking out webinars. You know. <laughs> Every other week, I think so. So, but also, uh, and the audience here is mainly recruiters. This, the one thing I would say right now, yeah. is this is a, a little bit of a golden opportunity. Our our expansion into South Africa. The reason we employ people in South Africa was not because we. For, it wasn't our intention. It was because a recruiter found the opportunity. He mm -hmm. found that there's a lack of available talent in the UK. There's an abundance of talent in in South Africa. So he went out introducing his, his clients in the UK to the talent in South Africa. It worked. And so what he's done is almost kind of increased his revenue by 30% through this model. To say, yeah. look, well, if you're, if you're, yes, most of his business is in the UK, but actually he's now looking that, at- That's South such Africa. a massive point. Yeah. That's a massive, you could, there, we, we, we actually no, we spent a lot of time company. talking about professional services and tech and that <clears> kind of thing. Now, if you're in that industry, recruiting in that industry, educate your clients. And I'll, I'll talk from experience. I had a very senior position, no, a very senior candidate who had specced into a, a, a big global airline. And they were like, we love him. We absolutely would hire him, but he lives in Greece. And there's no way we can have him work for us. There's no way we can make it work. And at that time, I didn't know about EOR. EOR yeah. And actually, that would have been a great time to be like, let me stop you there, Mr. Yeah. Pine. Let me educate you. Let me yeah. give you additional value and possibly open the doors for you for a whole host of new stuff that you haven't even thought about because of lack of awareness and lack of um, sort of just understanding. Yeah. So it's really, really, so it really can, good it can, point. There are recruiters now that I think could you know, really significantly change their business yeah. by just offering remote talent yeah. to their clients. All you have to do is find the talent uh, and, and you know, make sure but that's right not fit. hard. I'll tell, again, that's not hard. One of the biggest frustrations that the UK recruiters are having right now that I'm speaking to is they are getting more and more annoyed by the job boards because the job boards are actively promoting these vacancies all over the world. Mm -hmm. And nine out of ten applicants that come through within the first sort of 48 hours are abroad candidates and they're like, mm -hmm. We can't do anything with these people. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like, Hang on, put a pin in that because actually you might be okay. able to. What you need to do is talk to your client first and see if they're yeah. interested in it. Yeah. Because if the client's interested, it's just an introduction. It's a, you're an introduction away from actually filling those candidates rather than having to reject them all absolutely. every single time. Yeah. Before the cameras started rolling, we spoke about professional services. Yeah. I would have never have thought of knocking on a professional services door, no. ever, to say, oh, have you ever, no, you know, I would never have thought of that. 40% of our business right now is professional services who are using us to employ talent. And they, I don't think they would have done it five years ago. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, now yeah. they're open to well. Actually, we can have someone working in South Africa. And again, they're not. They're working with you guys. <coughs> and they're using you guys, but they're not. You're not finding this talent. The okay. source and selection is still happening by recruitment agencies. 100%. So there's there's an uh, yeah there's, there's an arm of, of revenue there that we're just writing off by not even looking at one hundred percent. So that's right. what I've been trying to get you know speak to recruiters about. And we have you know we have uh, uh, some some good partners, but the opportunity could be massive. Well, it is massive. Because this whole remote thing is is just going through the roof. This the EOR, um, you know, we're 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 a, a kind of five billion dollar industry right now. Mm -hmm. It'll be it's growing significantly. It'll be a hundred billion dollar industry in the next fifteen years. That's a lot of money. Now recruiters are leaving recruiters on the table. need to tap into that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'll, no, that's that's great. I'm I'm going to put that particular this last kind of few minutes clip. We'll put right at the start of the uh, the podcast to get people in, in like interested. Yeah. So I think that's. A really, really good point. This has been really fun. I appreciate yeah, you. Uh, yeah, this is really, appreciate you popping down. Um, if anyone's still listening, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for liking, subscribing, and doing all the things that you guys do to keep this channel alive and keep this podcast going. Um, we will see you again next week. But until then, thank you very much. Mate, this has been good. Thank you both. Enjoyed it. Yeah, that was really insightful.
Let's just talk about the escape plan. Yeah. <laughs> my joining. <laughs> Portugal is my escape plan.